I am David King from The Collaborative. Today I'm joined by Aaron Marquis from... The, you got this. I believe in you. I don't think I have it. Contemporary, Contemporary Circus <laughs> and Immersive <laughs> Arts Center. There we go. And and Cooper Stan. Hello. Who's a trapeze artist? I am. I mean, this is a pretty cool um, <laughs> podcast. Yeah, you not guys, your average podcast. Yeah, it is, it is absolutely not your average podcast. And um, we were talking just before this about the idea that in this podcast, uh, world of ours and this current system, people aren't incentivized to really pursue the things that, that they're interested in. And you guys are people who um, really pursued something that's unique and have talents that I, most people don't have. You're men of special skill sets. <laughs> it makes for great party talk. Mm. Every time I go, I know probably you do, we go to something and you say, oh, I studied at the National Circus School. All of a sudden, it's everything else sort of stops around you and now you've got to go into this whole speech about what that means. And it's But who a, believes you? In Initially, does everyone I, knows you're so the sincere? Question. You're so sincere that no one questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> People question it sometimes for me. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. They don't always believe it because wow. I think it's just the last thing they're expecting me to tell them I do for a living. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, funny. I'd never. <laughs> I've never experienced that sort of doubt from someone. I think it just shocks them so much that they're like, "I want to know more." But it, it's true what you were saying, though. It's we we were talking about this that we live in this time where people are discouraged to do what they want to do. And I think we both found this magical way to do that. And I think that's why the conversation stops is because people are so mystified by Mm -hmm. this concept of, yeah, we went off and joined the circus and circus itself is changing, is becoming an art form. And it's nice to have that conversation with people. I mean, I really enjoy being able to be sort of the front line of contemporary circus in a conversation with people at a party. So how did you both come to that place where this is what you wanted to do? Um, how did how did it turn into something very real? I think I was always interested in circus. And even from, I think when I was about six years old, I saw one of the PBS like specials of a Cirque du Soleil production. Mm-hmm. And I was really interested and drawn to it. But it wasn't until I was about 15 years old that I took an aerial class, which is like, aerial climbing, you know, fabric and different apparatuses. And that's when I found out through my teacher that you can actually go to a school for it. And it's not, it it wasn't as mystifying or like Mm. bizarre or like foreign to me at that point. So then I realized that I could actually look up schools, find a place that worked for me and, and just start training. And I mean, I grew up in the, the performing arts my entire life as a young actor and I went off to uh, New York City for a while, did playwright and musical theater, and came into circus through a friend of mine who has an after school summer program and started teaching with him after I learned some from him and went back to my second year of university and just said, I am not enjoying this, and came across the National Circus School's website and said, I'd love to go there. And my friend sitting next to me was like, Why don't you? Mm. So two weeks later, I dropped out of college and off I went. But sort of the same story as Cooper. I saw Cirque du Soleil on Bravo when I was a young kid and thought, I'd love to do that. And I didn't realize that it was an actual option. I had never processed that, oh yeah, people who end up in the circus, they have a training and a background and they they grow up doing something that brings them there. So for me it was theater and that's how I got into clowning. Was there not very different uh, Mm -hmm. acting and clowning? Yes, and I think because of the fact that, and. I also grew up performing, so I think we both already were looking at it from the eyes of someone who is on track for Mm -hmm. like an artistic field that already is um, sort of a commitment. You know, you know that you're, it's, um, I don't know, what is that? Like choosing to be a performer, choosing to be an artist, it's sort of a responsibility in a way. Um, And circus was sort of just an extension of that. And then realizing that we could train or like for myself, learning that I could train for it was just like, okay, so now how do I channel what I've learned so far into this new, you know, Mm -hmm. this this unexplored area of my body and my creativity. I I think it's a very common story in the circus community, the contemporary circus community, where it's a lot of people like us who had a background in something else that allowed them to go into circus and not necessarily what circus used to be, which was families. I mean, every so often you get someone who goes, oh, I I grew up and my parents were circus artists, but we're both first-generation circus artists, and I think that's very common nowadays. Mm -hmm. 
I, you know, I find it interesting that I, I, you're setting up the organization, you set up the organization yep. in Troy, um, and you do see thing, you know, performance art along these this, these lines in places like Hudson, mm -hmm. um, sort of moving up the, the river in some ways, and Troy is sort of the next logical place that people would start to enjoy this on a more regular basis and take it in because it is, has become, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, the center for arts and, and younger folks mm -hmm. in the region. Um, but what was the impetus to sort of establish it there and, and yeah, put it several in a several things. Um, I fell in love with a building in Troy that mm -hmm. uh, you know my big vision in my life is to turn it into a full time circus performance venue, and I and I hope that's still a reality as we you know sort of navigate what that would look like and how to work with the building owners. Um, and then the more I looked at it, is Troy in general is the most logical place for the circus community. When you look at the circus communities that you have in Montreal, which is probably the hub of it in North America, you've got New York City just south of, of us. Mm -hmm. And then of course you have Boston, which has some circus going on. And up in Brattleboro, Vermont, there's actually a, an accredited circus program oh. called the New England Center for Circus Arts. Um, so they're only, what, is that hour 45 to Brattleboro maybe? Um, Google map that, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> So it's, we're sort of in the middle of it all. It's easy to come down from Montreal and go to Troy and then keep going to the city. And that's sort of why we at the, the Contemporary Circus and Immersive Arts Center really push the concept of Troy being the next logical place for the circus community. Because we can get shows coming from Montreal to stop in Troy and go on to New York or out to Boston mm -hmm. or even vice versa and start to incentivize those companies to, to get them to want to be in the US and North America a little bit more coming from Europe. Um, but I also, I say this all the time, I feel like Troy is the, I live there, we just bought a house in Troy, my wife and I, and we both feel like Troy is the one city in the capital region that goes, yeah, we got a circus, that's our thing. <laughs> so. I, I mean, I can certainly see that, and uh, I, I mean, it is the the, the city for, for younger artists who are, who are mm -hmm. getting their start and, and even buying homes. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, you know, uh, we were talking a little off camera about this weird weekend I just had at Basilica uh, Hudson, and they also see themselves as sort of the middle ground between New York City and Montreal because Melissa Oftemar is from uh, right. Montreal, and she has a wealth of uh, friends who are performers of different ilks, including mm -hmm. uh, circus folks. So I wonder if there might be synergy there uh, eventually. But, oh, yeah, um, absolutely. But Troy does seem to be the place that might, you know, in a lot of ways, be this beacon for, for people who might not necessarily stop anywhere else. Between. Yeah, I think that's changing too, even more so now that, you know, now that I live here. I'm originally from the area, grew up here, went off to New York, as I said, in Montreal, uh, but came back and even during all that time that we've been here, which is, I guess, only three years, but we were coming back and forth when I was in school in 2014. Mm -hmm. Cooper had been here to work on some shows with us, uh, just sort of helping out, because he's from West Stockbridge in Mass. Oh, and right. Troy's changed so much. Yep. I mean, the downtown itself has changed, and it's sort of, you know, everyone talks about this a lot, but, you know, I saw it back in, you know, 2002 and 2003, and I've seen such an incredible change in the city, and I don't think it's stopping. I think people are just excited yeah. about having a downtown that's walkable and uh, having more apartments and more going on. And it's, it, it is drawing all these younger people, which is fantastic, and older people who no longer have kids who want to buy a nice three-story townhouse. I mean, my, uh, my experience um, when I was writing for Metroland right out of college, I had a, an editor who um, who was very big on Troy, and it was it was the joke in the office. Yeah. It was like this is not you know Troy is the place where everything was closing at the time. I went there in college to go to to Music Shack in high school. I I was go to the Music Shack there over on River Street, mm -hmm. and it closed, and it just felt like things you know. But then there was this undercurrent of creatives who were even then you know Troy Night Out was yeah. starting to get really big. Um, but now I don't think. You know, there's barely a conversation about which city is uh, it's better for that sort of <laughs> vibrant. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, but you know, I went away for um, I, I was essentially reporting on the legislature and traveling to Manhattan all the time. And when I came back, it was night and day. I mean, and now you see it grow monthly, um, which I think is is really exciting. So, how do you see um, this sort of institution? filling out and I mean what are the next steps so I mean the overview of the of the CCIC is essentially that we have three legs that we stand on which are uh, present 
produce and promote. So we want to present work that already exists by other companies, whether they're from Europe or, or Canada or even in the US as the US mm -hmm. circus community starts to evolve and change. Um, we'd like to produce more work, like we're producing uh, Cooper's uh, one-man show, Roadkill. Uh, that's really important to us to allow artists to have their ideas come to life. Um, and then of course the promoting part is just promoting circus as an art form, because I think in the US it's still seen as a spectacle um, and I don't say spectacle in a good or a bad mm. way, but it's that's how it's perceived right now. But we essentially want to use Troy as our home base, but not the only place that we are at. Uh, and that's why it's kind of funny, because right now we're called the Contemporary Circus and Immersive Arts Center, but we don't actually have a center or a building or a space that we are working out of constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, in the long run, we'd love to, but our vision is to be a circus and move around and do a show in Troy, but maybe do something in Saratoga or Schenectady or, or Albany or go outside of the Capital Region and certainly go through the state and through the U.S. and internationally. Uh, we sort of want to be this ever-evolving, growing, shifting, changing organization. And Cooper, um, tell me about the skill set that you need as a trapeze artist. I mean, it, it seems to me by looking at you, and mm -hmm. I, I hate to be too forward, but that you're—I mean, it looks like your art has shaped your body in mm -hmm. sense. And I mean, even your yeah, you know. no, it definitely has. Um, going to interest, you didn't say that about my body, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> You shake your body when you, you know you get dressed up. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, whole, you know. yeah. uh, I think that going into school with a lot of dance, I think dan my dance experience is what gave me such a strong you know foot forward mm -hmm. in the auditions. And when I went to the audition in Montreal, we were both at the same yeah we auditioned the same Montreal. year. Yep. And um, I think that they could see that I had training that would you know transfer well to an aerial apparatus. And I'd never done swinging trapeze before the audition, so they tested me on it. I'm terrified of heights, too. And <laughs> So am I. <laughs> am I right? And I remember that at Sticky the audition. That is. Mm -hmm. Well, they had me on a swinging trapeze. It was, I'm not sure how many feet above the ground that one is on the fourth floor of the school. And it's looking out a huge set Glass. of windows into the parking yeah. lot, the fourth floor. So not only was I like swinging through the air, but I was looking out. <laughs> into like this parking lot that was even further down. And it was terrifying, but I sort of felt like I just had to, okay, you gotta do it. You I can, get you into can the do school. this, yeah, I need, <laughs> I I need this. to train here. I need to get into this school. And I believe that they could see I had the potential. Um, and then the, the training, of course, then gave me a, a whole new awareness of my body. And instead of it being more rooted in my legs, I sort of then, yeah, then it shaped the upper portion of my body to be like, ah, this is how we hmm. hold ourselves in the air from one arm or from two arms and like, then learning about that. And it definitely has changed my entire, like my body awareness, my, how I hold myself mm -hmm. and. But we were, we were talking about this last night, actually, I just sort of connected this, that we were talking about, you know, people working out at gyms and then circus artists working out. And what I think is so interesting about circus is you're working out to build muscles that you will be using constantly. So it's not to build muscle to show it off, which mm -hmm. I think is yeah something right. that some people do. Um, no, that's why I do it. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Journalism has really like, shaped my life as well. There we go. The chair is, yeah. It's, that's what I. That's what I loved. To, even when I was at school, I mean, we had to do the exact same stuff besides our discipline. I still had to do the acrobatics and the stretching and the working out and all of that, even though I was doing clowning. Mm. And every muscle that we were building, we were building because we had to use it for the things that we had to accomplish. Mm -hmm. It was all function. Yeah, was, functional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to. Mm -hmm. That's that's a good word. Well, and, and that's <laughs> that's the gimmick. I mean, that's what they tell you. You're, you know, you're going to do it at, at all these different fads of yeah. uh, you know gym fads, but. I mean, your life, I would assume, depends on these muscles functioning in, in that, that core sense, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, it's your it's your job, it's your livelihood. I mean, that's... It's Especially really when you're in the air, I mean. Right. You, know? you gotta catch that, the trapeze as you're sweating back. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Hopefully those muscles are ready. <laughs> yep, yep. No, truly. And, and tell me a little bit about Roadkill. I mean... Sure. Uh, Roadkill is sort of a, a project that I started having ideas for it about four or five years ago, I think five years ago. Um, we talked about it briefly, Briefly, yeah. maybe two years ago. Uh, it was sort of just like an idea that kept bouncing around in my head and I was like taking notes on it and 
just sort of developing this concept, um, which has definitely changed a lot mm-hmm. from from then to now. We started working on it, or we start we planned to present it. Yeah. So I got I was approached by Liz at the the Art Center in Troy, mm-hmm. uh, who's been very supportive of. Uh, me as an artist and sort of what I want to do with the the circus in Troy and asked if we wanted to submit a grant to uh, New York State Council on the Arts and we said absolutely I didn't have an idea myself uh, but we had been talking so I said let's submit Roadkill and see what happens um, mm-hmm. yeah so we we at that point we sort of said oh maybe we should start looking yeah. at this yeah so laying more concrete like yep. planning for it and it's just sort of then been a snowball and it just kept kept rolling and and here we are now. Do and you want to say a little bit about the about the actual sort of the concept the of, content yeah, yeah, yeah. of yeah. the show? Sure. So the show is you basically see the lifespan of a wild fox. You see moments before he's born, and then you see moments after he has passed away. And the show is broken into different little uh, like scenes and moments where we sort of vignettes. see these vignettes that we see sort of the development of this wild animal and how his environment changes his perspective on the world Mm -hmm. and maybe um, how it adjusts his awareness of, you know, danger or of anything or or like finding things that he enjoys about life and then kind of embracing that maybe too much in some senses. And it is sort of just a little, I like to think of it as maybe something that anyone could watch it and relate to it or find things that they can relate to the character mm-hmm. and to relate to sort of the overall story and and the the because the question that we or the question that you originally yeah, I, I asked posed, me I posed a question to Cooper at the beginning of the rehearsal process is essentially who is this character and almost why do we care about him or why do we want to care about him uh, what do, what's the what are we trying to say with him? And I think through the creation process, we've done a, a really good job, and and I find it very interesting to to answer that question. And I think the fox as a character has not only did it start off as well, how does his environment shape him, but as us as an audience, as we start to watch it, it's how do we look at our environment that we're imposing upon these animals, mm. these wild animals, especially. I mean, we're presenting the show in Prospect Park in Troy, so it's outdoors. It's where animals live, but we've built this man-made park, and how do we influence their life? And I think that's, mm-hmm. I think that's an interesting mm-hmm. viewpoint mm-hmm. for the show. Yeah, for better or worse. Yeah, exactly. Also, just like yeah. how it affects their life. Not, it's not necessarily a commentary on. Um, though, I mean, we'll. I mean, I feel like you could look at it. And you can see things in the show that maybe you have a reference for because you've seen. Mm-hmm. You know, videos online of how we sort of have have changed the planet with our, yeah. you know, with the way we can be careless or, you know, just, you know, there's, there are, you know, as, as a dad, <laughs> what flushes through my mind is my daughter who who comes, uh, you know, is sort of at that point where she's amazed by nature and life and you know we see an owl we'll sit we'll pull over and watch the owl in the tree or mm-hmm. a hawk or and we fox has been very important lately because of this um song <laughs> what 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 does the fox say yeah, yeah. Sure. um <laughs> but uh we've seen some some you know living foxes is very enamored with it and can't believe it you know and it feels like this very special thing but she hasn't noticed roadkill and i hope she never does mm-hmm. <laughs> or she maybe she hasn't yeah, you know, thought to question it, but it, it does speak to that larger loss of innocence as a society or something when mm-hmm. you realize that just traveling somewhere, you're these very special things are, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and so maybe I'm heightened and more tuned to that because of fatherhood or whatever. But that's um, that's really interesting because the sort of the the idea of roadkill being it's sort of a title that you might hear and think like, oh, yeah. that's and we know it's and then if you see the show, it's about. An animal, so roadkill. You think of this like ah, oh, that's kind of a, a tragic end to a nice, you know, cute little animal's life. Yeah. Spoiler. And, <laughs> spoiler alert. But we, uh, I, I mean, I think I don't. I like to think of roadkill. When I see roadkill, I think of the sad yeah. things of it. I think of the like that last moment where this animal wasn't expected. It was maybe aware of the danger and and didn't get out of the way in time or somehow like it just wrong place, wrong time. But you know. In the end, that was part of this animal's life. Mm-hmm. So, roadkill. I think for someone, 
like your daughter who is sort of enamored with this fun little creature, hopefully people can then appreciate even the, you know, darker or more, you know, disappointing uh, aspects of, of, of a natural life cycle, the natural process of any wild animal's life. I was going to say, it's, we talked about this too in terms of the, the title being Roadkill and thinking about your daughter, you know, when hopefully not, she doesn't see Roadkill, obviously she will at some point, but not yep. while she's too young. <laughs> yeah, that's inevitable, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but something just Cooper said, Cooper just said was, uh, for us, the title isn't, uh, and when you see an animal, Roadkill, it's not who they are. It's what's happened to them, but yep. it's not what their life was as an animal. Uh, and I, we're certainly trying to go for that with the show that we go, yes, this is a part of what's going to happen to mm -hmm. this animal, but see this animal in other contexts and see how it's lived and you go, that's not who the animal is at all. It's just something that unfortunately happened to them. I mean, I mean if you, if, I mean, making the leap, if you apply this, if you, if you then apply this sort of human term. I was, yeah, was going like to say this. Building mm -hmm. empathy or, yeah. yeah uh, Absolutely. That, you know, unfortunately, people in their lives, stuff happens to them and maybe they take the wrong turn or you know, something unfortunate happens to them and they do pass away. However they pass away, that's not who they right. they are or were. It's for that brief moment in their time, that's what happened to them. But there's so much more to us as humans besides where we end up. And I think there's a lot of that in the story mm -hmm. is it's how you get there and the journey that you take. It's not the, the end that makes who you are. You're not just a statistic. <laughs> But, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, how can people check out the show? When is the when is the performance? Next weekend. Yep. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so September twenty seventh and twenty eighth at seven p.m. in Prospect Park in Troy, beautiful park if you've never been there, uh, and it is completely free for wow. anyone to come. We wanted to make it free to the community to experience circus. Uh, we knew that a lot of people. This is going to be their first time, and I, I'm a really big believer in sharing the arts, but also. I don't think we can ask people to come and pay for something if they have no idea what it is. I'd rather people get excited about it and then remind them, hey, by the way, we're a nonprofit. Uh, so it is a suggested donation of $15, but it's it's free for anyone to come. Uh, and I, there's more information online. Yeah, and, and I mean, how should folks who maybe this piques their interest get involved down the road or reach out to you about? The, the best thing to do is sign up for our, our mm -hmm. newsletter. Um, and you can do that right at uh, www.ccic.us. Um, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. We're on all those sort of social media platforms. And that's the best way to get involved because at some point, you know, we're a young nonprofit, but at some point we're going to need volunteers and we're going to need people to help us, you know, accomplish the big dream that we want to accomplish. And, and Cooper, how long are you, I mean, do you plan on performing this here more than once, or are you off to? Well, we have, so we have two performances next weekend. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the possibility of moving forward with this show, mm -hmm. and that's a conversation that we're just going to sort of, um, I think, but play it by ear in a sense, yeah. but it's something that I would love to continue with because the show means a lot to me, and it's something that I would love to keep sharing. So I think we're going to work together. Yeah, and, and, and that's the vision of sort of the show that Cooper is doing. We're doing through our Artist First program, which puts the artist at the center of the creation process and helps them to understand what it's like to produce a show. Because mm -hmm. a lot of circus artists want to, but have never gone through that process. And I know I struggled with it as a younger artist. Uh, so I wanted to give those tools to other artists. And so the conversation we're having is what happens to Roadkill after next weekend? Do we, do we continue with it? Do we let it evolve? Do we bring it to other festivals, to outdoor festivals, indoor programming? How do we, how do we take the show to the next level and sort of help the show evolve? Um, and that's sort of a big vision of the CCIC as well as to push shows out from Troy. So not just have them come here and then yeah. end, but give them a, a life afterwards. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be interested in uh, hearing what the next steps are and um, I, hope to be there as well um so yeah, please do come on the, yeah uh, looking forward to it so thank you guys so much for thank you. sharing thank everything you. and um yeah maybe we'll check in down the road yeah please do thanks so much thank you thanks